we are live good evening everyone welcome to i focus online lecture 197 and retina session 49 today we have with us dr kumar saurabh sir and he'll be talking on the second part of clinical trials that is clinical trials in amd i request dr lalit parma sir to please introduce dr kumar saurabh sir thanks rolika and thanks antosh it's my pleasure again to be part of this uh, very unique program i focus a wonderful program conceived by Santosh. And uh, also it's my privilege to introduce a very dear colleague from Calcutta, Dr. Kumar Saurabh. He's a practicing VR surgeon at Kitralem and BBI Foundation. And he's also at this young age on the actual board of PGO. And there's a huge number already centurion in this uh, you know, uh, peer-reviewed index journals. So today's topic uh, is on uh, clinical trials in AMD. And all this information, believe me, is available on Google. And why this talk? The relevance is I think Saurav will take a lot of time to, you know, to explain that what Neosuro ARMD has gone through or what ARMD in general has gone through. Because the relevance of this, all these talks is it lays the foundation for a lot of our current practices and norms. And what I would request all the audience who is listening, and even later on they will have an access on the YouTube, is to memorize at least some of them. You see, I think Saurav also may not uh, remember the exact count, or I also will not know the exact count. There is more than 102, 104. Sometimes we get misled by you know these mnemonics which keep coming and which uh, keep confusing. But a couple of trials are landmark trials in AMD, which nobody can afford, especially retinologists and even comprehensive eye surgeons, because it adds to their uh, knowledge. So some of the five, six talks which I offhand may remember is Marina, Anchor, Pyre, uh, Pronto, Cat. These five, six talks, nobody Nobody, you know, just today, especially who is dealing in medical right now, because if you have this knowledge of, uh, you know, these uh, uh, talks, you are better equipped to talk to a patient. You are better equipped to counsel a patient. And hence, that patient will always, always follow your, uh, whatever advice you give him. So I will not come in between uh, this very important talk of clinical trials. And uh, I know in ARMD, the best is still yet to come. Whatever today we are practicing, GV, when we were even consultants, we never used to know about all these agents. But today, the best available will be presented to you. And remember, the best is still yet to come. There are a lot of trials still happening in uh, AMD, especially, especially dry AMD, complement cascade pathways we studied in detail. There's so much details and every day you hear so many uh, you know, drugs and molecules being tried. So over to Saurabh and all the best. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for the kind introduction. And as you rightly said, uh, I will not like to dwell much on the numbers, but through the chronology of events, how the studies have evolved and which study was uh, felt necessary when and why was the study done? What was the take home message from that? So are my slides visible now? Yes. Yes, sir. yes, sir. Okay. So good evening again. I am Dr. Kumar Saurav and I'm from Kolkata. This is, these are my financial disclosures. So I'll be talking about AMD trials. Uh, so if we begin how AMD have been, the disease has evolved over, over the last couple, uh, two, three or four decades is that well before 1980s, there was, if somebody has a neovascular AMD, the outcome was vision loss. There was no treatment. Then many things were tried and the Studies have evolved from MPS to TAP to Hawk and Harrier right now and other studies which we will see. Initially, we tried to prevent vision loss. And then when we could, we were able to prevent vision loss, then we thought of why not just prevent, why just prevent vision loss? Why not try to improve the vision? And when we started to improve the vision, then we tried to know, do why not just improve the vision more economically, more comfortably for the patient. That's what the stage which we are in. We have drugs which are able to improve the vision. 
but we are still a little far away from finding the right regimen, finding the right way to treat. We have the drugs, but future studies will tell how to treat and how which regimen will be the best. So far, historical point of view, we will start with MPS study. This, these are these are important for uh, postgraduate students, and uh, we need to know that MPS was not just for ANMD. It was for idiopathic and uh, histoplas histoplasmosis also. Initially, Krypton uh, organ study was started. Then Krypton laser came into being, and then foveal study was done. This obviously, this uh, study was not uh, very did not give any much favorable outcome. And when the question asked was whether laser would prevent vision loss, and the answer was no, laser did not prevent vision loss. In fact, when the argon study was started, there was so much of uh, loss of vision because of the argon laser, the study was dropped in between. And we did not find laser to be suitable for preventing vision loss, rather it led to more vision loss. So next was treatment of neovascular AMD with PDT. The TAP study was first landmark study for that. When uh, the question asked was whether PDT with vertiporfin safely reduced the vision loss in subfoveal CNVM due to neovascular AMD. An answer what we got from PD, a TAP study was that PDT did reduce vision loss. That means uh, more than 15 lesser, letters of vision loss when we compared it with placebo. However, vision loss was limited or the, this favorable outcome was limited to predominantly classic CNVMs and not to a minimally classic or occult CNVMs. So take away point from MPS and TAP study where laser photoagulation did not stop vision loss. PDT did reduce vision loss predominantly in predominantly classic CNVM. However, these two treatment modalities did not have any scope of improvement of vision. So then uh, further down the line, uh, anchor study came uh, was performed. And then the question was asked when we had ranibizumab that will ranibizumab lead to reduced vision loss and also improvement in vision? That was an important question. First time an improvement in vision was being considered. So this was a phase three study of two years duration and, and the, uh, it included cases where predominantly classic CNVM. End point was percentage of eyes which lost less than 15 letters and percentage of eyes which, which gained more than 15 or more letters. So this was a three-armed study where arm one was vertiborfin PDT, uh, second arm was ranibizumab without uh, any PDT, sham PDT uh, with 0.3 milligram and third arm was 0.5 milligram of ranibizumab. So basically, there were the three arms were vertiporfin PDT, 0.3 milligram ranibizumab, and 0.5 milligram ranibizumab. So this landmark study for, for the first time showed that there was a treatment which will not just reduce the vision loss, but also have get us an improvement in vision. And as seen in this chart, we can in this line diagram, we can see that vertiporfin PDT, the green um, Trace shows that at the end of 24 months, there was a loss of 9.8 liters, whereas both uh, regimens, both doses of ranibizumab led to vision improvement, 10.7 liters and 8.1 liters. So this uh, landmark trial sort of established ranibizumab or anti-VGF as a treatment modality which would improve the vision in AMD. So next question was, uh, the, now anchor was mainly for the predominantly classic CNVM and, and, and we those times, uh, fluorescent angiography was uh, mainly uh, the mainstay of the investigation of NMD and, and CNVMs were defined as predominantly classic occult, which is not the case right now, which is because mainly it is based on OCT nowadays. So then minimally classic and occult CNVMs were left out in anchor study. So another study was done, which was equally landmark, which was called MARINA. And the question asked was whether anibizumab would lead to re reduced in vision reduced vision loss and improvement in vision in many minimally classic and occult CNV. So again, it was a phase three study, two years duration of minimally classic and occult. The endpoints were same. It was a three arm study. In this, uh, in this study, there was no vertiporfin and we had a sham injection arm, ranibizumab 0.3 and ranibizumab 0.5 milligram arms. So at the end of two years, we would note that in minimally classic and occult CNVMs also, Ranibizumab was working well and it was leading to improvement in vision of 6.6 .6 and 5.4 letters. 
sham injection was obviously not leading to improvement in vision. So the anchor established ranibizumab for treatment of predominantly classic and minimally classic and occult was established with the help of Marina. All the future trials and all the treatment modalities, uh, all the treatment regimens are, have evolved from there. So these two study give us some takeaway points that ranibizumab prevented vision loss and also led to improvement. It also prevented disease progression. However, these were just two years, uh, two year long studies and uh, the future was uncertain. We did not know how these treated eyes will evolve in four years or seven years or 10 years down the line. So what the, what the team did, they continued these eyes and some of other eyes from the focus study, there was another focus study into a, uh, into a different kind of real world study, which was called Horizon. And uh, these, in th these eyes were taken out of Marina and Anchor and they were followed up and the treatment was done with same randomizumab, but it was done on pe uh, physician's discretion. Means when the physician noted that there was some activity, he would treat it and uh, otherwise he would not, he or she would not. So this was called PRN regimen, which was a sort of a real, uh, real world uh, extension of Marina and Anchor. The end point was incidence of adverse event because Anchor and Marina did not tell much about adverse event. They did tell us about the improvement in vision part, but Horizon tried to look at what, what wrong can ranibizumab do and what was the long-term visual outcome. So at the end of four years, ranibizumab was still well tolerated. There were not much, many cases of endophthalmitis or uh, other ocular in, uh, complications. And it was also noted that the visual acuity gain, which was achieved in Arim Marina and Anchor when the patients were treated with monthly regimens was not continued when the treatment was shifted to physician's discretion, when the treatment was shifted to PRN regimen so because the, the patient tend to receive lesser number of injections and the visual equity was not maintained to the level which, which was noted in Marina and Anchor. Further, after Horizon, the patients were still followed up further in the seven up study, which was again a real world study. So the patients in Marina and Anchor and then in Horizon were further followed up for three to four years. And we, uh, we it, um, it was uh, wanted to, it, it, was, uh, it was sought that what happens after seven years. So ultimately 155 patients from 14 centers were eligible and then 65 patients were enrolled in this uh, seven up study which was again a real world data. Primary endpoint in this was percentage of eyes with 20 by 70 or better vision. Secondary endpoint one mean change in letters and fluorescent angiography, SDOCT and AF findings. So now we were looking at other things, what, what else can uh, anti-VGF cause inside the eyes? So this seven up study was not very, uh, not very encouraging uh, if you can say, if I can say though, because it has a lot, lot of one thirds in it. The primary endpoint was 20 by 70 or better vision. However, only 37% of eyes could maintain 20 by 70 or better vision when from out of Anchor and Marina, they were followed up for seven years with a PRN regimen. In, similarly, 20 by 200 or 6 by 60 vision or worse was noted in one third around 37% of eyes. Secondary endpoints again, more than 15 letters dec decline was again seen in sort of one third eyes. Leakage, Still after seven years of treatment, first two years in Marina Anchor, then at PRN up to seven years, still fluorescent angiography showed leakage in half of these eyes, 48%. Still OCT showed exudation in 68% of these eyes. Macular atrophy on autofluorescence was noted in almost 98, almost every eye which treated with anti-VGF and foveal atrophy was also noted in a significant number of eyes. So seven years did not look rosy after Marina and Anchor. Then further analysis, if we start from horizon and then go to seven years, then what was noted is that eyes which had received more than 11 injections significantly, they had a significantly better gain in visual equity. So in horizon, we had seen that after exiting from Marina Anchor monthly regimen, the vision, uh, visual improvement dropped. And again, when we did a subset analysis of those eyes which had more injections, like more than 11 injections, we noted that in spite of the fact that they had uh, leakage and OC, exudation on OCT and atrophy, more number of injections meant better gain in visual equity. So that was uh, one subset analysis, which was important. So simply it meant that 
if you need to maintain the vision, you need to give um, give more number of injections. That was uh, out of this seven up seven up uh, study. So takeaway points where eyes previously treated with ranizumab were still at risk of losing vision in long term in real world when they are shifted to PRN, and it was not very easy to identify final improvement on worsening, which I will improve, which I will not. It is still, uh, it was not uh, very clear um, after Marina, Anchor, and Horizon 7 up. So, until now, fluorescent angiography had been the cornerstone of management of neovascular AMD. Then we shift, uh, there was this small pronto study where neovascular AMD uh, was again evaluated, and the question asked was whether we can treat neovascular AMD just with OCT and visual equity and without doing an FFA. The answer was yes. This study told us, and this study actually set up uh, the flow of uh, events and then many studies have been ultimately based on OCT alone, with leaving the FFA aside. So it was a three month, uh, three month uh, in, this, uh, in this study, three monthly injections were followed up by retreatment at months when there was an increase in central retinal thickness of more than 300 micron on OCT or a drop in vision of more than five liters. So, if you see the results of this study, based on simply on OCT and uh, visual equity, we noted that 37 eyes, in 37 eyes, visual equity improved by 11.1 .1 letter and CRT reduced by 212 microns, which meant that OCT alone and OCT with visual equity was good enough or fair enough to treat these eyes with uh, neovascular AMD. So that was about ranibizumab until now. Then we had this view and we had view two studies. I'm going in chronological order to make us understand how the science has evolved over the period of time. So at that same time, aflibercept molecule came into being and then V1 and V2 were the three, uh, two phase three trials, which asked the question whether monthly or bi-monthly aflibercept would work in comparison to monthly ranibizumab. Will it give the same kind of result which we got in ranibizumab until now? So it was a double mast phase three study, and it obviously and this uh, this was a non inferiority design, and it had four arms. The four arms, the arm one had aflibercept given 0.5 milligram given monthly. Second arm was two milligram given monthly, and third arm was aflibercept given at one month interval for three months, and then bi monthly, uh, two two milligram bi monthly afterwards. And fourth arm was the gold standard at that time, ranibizumab. 0.5 milligram monthly. So what this view and view one and view two studies tell us, they told us that both ranibizumab and aflibercept led to similar kind of improvement in vision, and uh, they were both comparable. What did so? What it did show as if we compared the central retinal thickness reduction was that when aflibercept was given at two monthly interval or eight weekly interval, there was a sawtoothing of central retinal thickness. When the, at the end of two months, just before the next injection, the central retinal thickness tend to increase. And then when the injection was given, it, it would fall down. But again, as the gap was two months, the central retinal thickness would increase. And this, this gave us the sawtooth appearance, which will, which will again come across in further slides. Though V1 and V2 studies did show sawtoothing at two monthly interval injections, but this did not turn into loss of vision or not non-improvement in vision, but that there was CRT fluctuations on two monthly interval. So what was the outcome? Aflibercept was proven to be non-inferior to ranibizumab. Ocular side effects and systemic side effects were comparable for both ranibizumab and aflibercept. And sort of thing, as I said earlier, was a significant finding at two monthly interval. The next was CAT study which asked the question whether vivacizumab was non-inferior to ranibizumab because we were trying to find out uh, the medicine which would, uh, which would treat and which would be cost effective and which would require lesser number of injections. So, so this study was conducted, it was a single blind phase three study. Again, it was a non-inferiority design. It is important to note that here the non-inferiority was defined as five liters. This was a four-armed study where monthly vivacizumab was given and monthly ranibizumab was given, and PRN bevacizumab and PRN ranibizumab wow. were given. So two monthly and two PRN for both drugs. So what did this study say? This study told us that if we compare the letters gained at, at, at the end of one year, all four arms gave similar outcome. 
there was no difference in uh, either med either molecule in either any regimen if we if we compare more than 15 letter loss at the end of one year again similar number of eyes lost more than 15 letters in all four arms if we ask that what happened at the uh, at the end of two, two years which uh, which regimen was more effective in in improving the vision which which regimen was more effective in number get, getting the more number of letters uh, for the patient then it was noted that though all the meds, uh, four arms were same but if we compare monthly regimens against prn regimens then monthly regimen would lead to more number of eyes getting more letters compared to prn regimen so again we came to same uh, scenario where prn was shown to be not as uh, effective as monthly regimen then came this ivan study i1 study where again bevacizumab was compared with ranibizumab and it was a non inferiority design here that non inferiority was defined as 3.5 liters primary outcome was visual acuity at 2 years and what i1 study did additionally over cat was that it also uh, studied the primary safety measures like arterial thromboembolic event hospital administration admissions because of heart failure which cat did not do uh, or cat cat was not um, designed to do so again it was a four arm study where uh, ranibizumab monthly and uh, prn and bevacizumab uh, monthly and prn were compared similar kind of results were found in i1 study as well letters gained at two years were same for bevacizumab and ranibizumab again in this monthly regimen and PR, prn regimen was found to be equally effective in number of letters gained at 2 years if we compare lesion size reduction retinal thickness at the end of 2 years or appearance of new geographic atrophy both ranibizumab and bevacizumab are comparable arterial thromboembolic events or heart failure needing admissions were similar in bevacizumab and ranibizumab it was also similar when a monthly regimen was compared to prn regimen so what this study added over cat was that the premise of bevacizumab give having more adverse uh, cardiac and systemic events was uh, not so not so sure and it was uh, it was more or less comparable to ranibizumab uh, in those terms so where did we stand at this point of time there were set of studies like anchor marina and view 1 and view 2 who were proponents of monthly regimen and there were uh, studies like prn cat and i1 which told us that uh, prn would uh, equally be would be equally effective so now at this point of time i would like to highlight there are other studies as well which which were done at this point of time and which need to be read and gone through but these are the basic studies or these are the lab, the must know study which i have been uh, which i have discussed here and which would be probably be asked for post graduate students so now we have the, we had the medicines but we still wanted to do some more we still wanted to give some more uh, benefit and some more comfort to the patient so we tried to tweak the regimen either monthly or prn somebody said some study said same somebody said monthly was better so now this treat and extend was devised and this trend study was done which tried to compare treat and extend with monthly injections the question asked was whether ranibizumab in treat and extend after two monthly injections was safe and effective as monthly regimen this was a phase 3 study of one year duration primary outcome was non inferiority of treat and extend primary outcome measure was non inferiority of treat and extend uh, over monthly and secondary outcome measure was change in central subfield thickness so in this study what we noted uh, actually ultimately was mean letters mean number of letters gained in treat and extend and monthly ranibizumab was same no significant difference central subfield thickness at the end of uh, follow up was same and number of injections required in treat and extend was less than monthly uh, treatment arm so that was a very important finding which for the first time said that treat and extend is a new regimen which would work effectively and probably would lead to lesser number of uh, visits and lesser number of uh, number of injections for the patient altair study did the same thing for aflibercept it uh, asked the question whether aflibercept can be given in treat and extend after three months injection and would it be safe and effective now there was slight difference compared if we compared with the trend study it was a phase 3 2 years duration study but there were two ways of adjustment in treat and extend here it was adjusted at two weekly gap and four weekly gap primary outcome measure was mean change in visual acuity in the two treat treat and extend regimen so mean change in visual acuity in all altair showed that both uh, 
two weekly uh, extension and four weekly extension and treat and extend were similar. They did not have much difference in the final visual acuity. And similarly, the, if we consider the central retinal thickness reduction, again, two weekly extension and four weekly extension in the Altair with aflibercept gives similar kind of outcome. So Altair study sort of established aflibercept in treat and extend protocol. So what this treat and extend ultimately actually is, it, it's a different sort of different uh, than monthly. It is also different from PRN. It is a balance of both worlds, monthly and PRN. Initially, the patient, the eye is treated with monthly injection until the maximum visual equity and uh, disease regression is obtained. Usually it is three injections, but it can be more than that also. When the patient has achieved maximum visual equity and we have a scarred CNVM, then at the next visit, we reassess the disease activity and treat the patient. We do not, in what, what we did in PRN was that we tried to know that whether if the disease is active, then we would treat. If the disease was not active, then we would not treat. Here, when the, when the patient came next, we treated. And if we found that there was no disease activity uh, um, at the time of treatment, at the time of injection, we would increase the gap of our piece follow-up by two weeks. And that, that's how, and keep on treating patient at every, at every uh, visit. If there was no disease activity, Okay, if there was disease activity and no disease activity, I, in either scenario, we would in, treat and increase the gap. The idea was to reduce the number of visits. An idea was to maintain uh, the visual gain and, and maintain the inactivity or maintain the, or prevent the activity from coming back. It was a balance of both worlds. So what did we know until now? Treat and extend achieve the same visual activity with lesser number of injections and lesser number of visits. It was established for, for aflibercept in Altair and trend established for ranibizumab. And ranibizumab and aflibercept were comparable in monthly, comparable in PRN, and comparable in treat and extend, all three regimens. So finally, this Hawk and Harrier study came into being. And here, until now, we were, we were uh, treating patients, trying to treat patients from monthly to PRN to treat and extend now. But still, there was something missing. Still, we were not able to increase the gap between two injections, not able to reduce the number of visits for the patient. So another molecule came into being, which is this RTH 256, which was, uh, which was further named as brolucizumab. And these two Hawk and Harrier phase three multi-centered trials actually asked the question whether brolucizumab was non-inferior to aflibercept, because why aflibercept? This question is always asked that why not ranibizumab? Why aflibercept? So aflibercept is a gold standard uh, of uh, the number one treatment for neovascular AMD in West. So aflibercept was uh, chosen as the gold, as the starting baseline. And borosinumab was compared in this phase three study for two years duration. This uh, slide might have been seen by many uh, students, many postgraduates who have been visit, who have been attending seminars and webinars. So what was done in this? Uh, a Hawk and Harrier similarly designed study was there was a matched phase where injections were, were given at one monthly interval. And after that, aflibercept was given at, uh, uh, at every two months, as it was mentioned in the level. And uh, rolucizumab was given in three milligram and six milligram dose. And it was there was multiple disease as, as, um, in a treat and extend fashion, and there were multiple a disease activity assessment visits where if we found if the effort is, if it was found that there is any disease activity then the gap would be reduced by two weeks or otherwise it would be followed up in treat and extend method so what did hawk and harriet tell us that both at week 48 and week 96 brolucizumab 3 milligram and brolucizumab 6 milligram were comparable to aflibercept 2 milligram when it when it visual acuity gain number letter number of letters gain was considered and this established brolucizumab as a medicine as a as a drug which would be we should give equal uh, number of letters gain and which would be equally tolerated by the patient visual visual outcome was effective and it was comparable injection frequency what we were trying in hawk and harrier with this molecule was to increase the gap by up to maximum three months. And it was noted that at the end of 48 weeks, which is around one year time, more than half of the patients were 
we have we have been able to maintain on three monthly prodoxizumab injections so this was the first time when we could increase we could rather effectively and successfully increase the gap between two injections by three months in neovascular amd that was a, that would have been a wow thing that uh, and if everything went well if everything goes well then it would definitely be uh, very uh, helpful for in number in reducing the number of injections as well as reducing the number of visits for the patients um, more reduction of central subfield thickness was noted when we compared it with aflibercept that was a dip, um, that was one finding which was important though the number of letters gain were comparable but central subfield thickness uh, reduction was more in prolocizumab now uh, there have been a lot of adverse events which were noted in hawk and harrier studies intraocular inflammation retinal artery occlusions and few cases of retinal vasculitis have also been noted so this has uh, little dampened the the euphoria behind this molecule however uh, it's still early times and then maybe if we can uh, it will only if, if with passage of time only we will be able to know that how aflibercept would further be compared with prolocizumab we would also look at ranibizumab being compared with uh, prolocizumab and decide that how uh, safe and effective prolocizumab is further reading i would like to suggest at this point is uh, about two molecules which which are abcpar pagol and paris parisimab which are uh, there are two couple of studies which have been which are being considered done and these studies would be in future help help us in understanding how these drugs behave and whether they can be of uh, use in future so these are few few of the studies based uh, basic studies or the or the pillar stone studies if i can so say so have which have established uh, ranibizumab aflibercept which have started from mps from laser to pdt to antivgf and that's how we that's where we stand right now there are other studies also uh, which which we can study and we, which we can go through but uh, for for post graduates these are the those which are must know and these are those which can be asked in the exams and which the student would like would would probably want to answer so i will end my uh, presentation here thank you very much Uh, thank you so much, sir, for summarizing it so well. Uh, we have Dr. Lalit uh, Lalit Verma sir here and Dr. Sabesachi sir here. So, sir, if you can give your views on this, and then we can take the questions. I think uh, Shifali, first priority should be given to take questions okay, because sir. the you know this hot seas are very important for us. Yes, sir. Uh, so the uh, one very important question asked is uh, if like sir can give some practical tips for uh, the post graduates to remember so many trials to actually present it very crisply on the papers because it's like there are so many trials here to remember and actually to present it well so that uh, they highlight the relevant points in their papers. Really, I think uh, he presented only not even twenty percent of them. Yes. What I'm saying is, the, but the, the trials he presented, nobody can afford to forget. Mm -hmm. Like molecule wise, if we go, sort of, uh, would you agree that you know if we start from uh, uh, Lucentis or Rani Uzibab, Marina, Anchor, Cat, Pronto, Pyre, nobody can afford to miss. And come to Afli Bercept, uh, I think View One and View Two are the landmark trials. And coming to the latest, uh, this Grossi uh, Map, Hawk and Harrier is the one of the trials which people. So this eight nine trials, uh, Sabesachi, would you agree? People, you know, everybody should know. There are a lot of other trials uh, concerning uh, dosing regimens, concerning uh, you know uh, what treatment protocol to follow. So those are there. Those, are, as I said, can be googled. In fact, I had requested Novartis. They had brought out a compendium in uh, in I think indoor conference where all the trials till date have been. Put together in a book, which I am after their life, and hopefully in this AIS we will still be releasing. So, don't go for numbers as uh, Saurav had made this point in the beginning. Try to learn the concept. Like he built up story very uh, you know carefully. First was the efficacy, then came side effects, then we established for a long time running this web and running this web and a few percent. Then we tried to widen the gap. Then uh, again, uh, Brodusumab came to make it Q12. So this conceptually, people should understand. 
Muscular ARMD is different from BME and vascular blocks. Here, the VEGF load is very, very high. And I think uh, Sabesachi and Kumar Saurav would agree that we cannot, cannot today uh, tell this patient that you go PRN from the beginning. She, uh, although PRN looks very, uh, you know, economically viable for the patient because it reduces the number of visits, reduces the number of injections, but the ultimate result, as Saurav had reminded, you know, in multiple slides, more the number of injections, better the benefit. So that has to be remembered by everybody. Yes, uh, Saurav? Yes, sir. I agree with you, sir. Uh, because uh, it has multiple studies have shown that the eyes which received more number of injections fared well. But the problem again remains that how many number of injections. So treat and extend, that's, that's how the treat and extend was devised. Yes. To balance both worlds, less number of injections, less number of visits and equal efficacy. So as, as far as the, the question was considered that concerned that how to rememorize all these trials. So what I would suggest is to try to weave a story behind these trials, why this study was done. What was the need of doing this study? Why, why somebody would do, do this study? So there was a question behind this study, a question at the beginning of the study, and that they tried to answer this question. If we go in sequence in chronology, forgetting about the exact numbers, numbers are not important. The story and the conclusions are important. If we read it like a story, then we can memorize each of them. That's how we should do it. Yes, sir, Mr. Sajid. Yes, a very good evening to everyone. So I think uh, Kumar Saurav has presented very nicely in terms of you know looking at it in terms of the question asked and the answer, the primary answer and some other right. which yes, it's a good way of uh, sort of remembering and also presenting in your exams. You know, for PGs to remember, you know, I'll just quickly share my screen if if that is okay with you. Uh, yeah, please, please go. Ahead. You know, so this is the uh, you know AAO PPP or uh, you know uh, the AAO calls it the preferred practice patterns you know and uh, this is all freely available on on Google so you can just go and say AAO PPP uh, AMD or something like that and you know when you click this PDF version what opens up is you know this is what opens up and you know so this is a uh, template on how you can, you know, what are the main things that you need to remember for every study. So this is the name of the study, you know, so this, I'm not able to rotate this, excuse me, but, uh, you know, so this is like a cheat sheet. You can actually keep it in your room, so, uh, you know, stick it on a wall somewhere if you want. This is the name of the study, you know, so this is Anchor, Marina, View and View 2. Then this tells you about the number of patients and tells you about patient characteristics in terms of, you know, how they were at presentation. And duration and frequency of treatment. So, how many injections were needed? And, you know, because uh, some of this may be asked in your uh, actual exams as well. And then, you know, uh, how did vision, uh, you know, happen? So, vision loss of uh, 15 letters or more, vision gain of 15 letters or more, then vision loss of uh, 15 letters. Uh, yeah, so, so you know these are all the treated eyes and then untreated eyes overall and then you now total number of years of uh, enrollment you know so this is a template which you can actually use you know so when you look at all i'll just stop my screen share so i think when you can uh, when you look at all these studies in in one place one below the other it sort of makes a bit more sense in terms of you know how it, it has evolved uh, as kumar saurabh has said and you know this uh, template if you look at the uh, preferred practice patterns ends at 200, uh, 2019. So, you know, a lot of this Brolosuzumab and some other trials, uh, Aries and Altair that he talked about are not there. So, you know, PGs, you can actually just, you know, sort of, you know, look at some of those papers published and, you know, fill in those details. So you can have like a cheat sheet, you know, and you can actually follow this for, uh, you know, any other clinical trial like DME or AMD or, you know, whatever that may be. And when it's asked in your exam, you can actually present it in this tabular fashion. It makes a very good impression, you know, and the examiner, then really knows oh, you know that you have actually uh, done your uh, work and it's relatively easy to remember so just follow this template for exams i think it really works well yes if only more questions uh, so a basic one but one of the viewers wants to uh, understand better what is the difference between treat and extend and pr and treatment if it could be explained again so uh, although sort of spent nearly 3 4 minutes on one slide uh, what i would uh, sort of if you permit the PRN means pro rata nita. So that means when the disease activity is there, you treat. And disease activity by definition means either there's a fresh subretinal hemorrhage or there's a visual equity loss of at least uh, one line or five letters or there is a, the uh, OCT. What the what third was for? Fluid. Yeah. So then, then, then only you treat. 
that OCT thickness, OCT thickness. Whereas, whereas if you say T to an extent, here we are trying to elongate the interval between two injections, irrespective of the disease activity. PRM means is inject if activity plus, don't inject if no activity. The student extent means that we have extended this regimen because patient was stable for uh, you know, four injections. And since it is stable, we extend the interval not monthly now, not after every four weeks. We call it after six weeks. And at six weeks, mandatorily we inject, irrespective of the activity. So that's the difference. So here, the, the difference is, in treatment extent, we are proactive in treatment. That before the activity comes, we treat a lot of these eyes. Whereas in, uh, in PRN, we are reactive. Reactive means you react to the situation. That if there is a reaction, means that three, uh, three things which uh, have been told. That if there is visual tree loss, if there is an OCT gain, uh, increase, or the hemorrhage, then you inject. So always proactive regimens are considered better because you don't allow activity to surface, and then inject. PRN, therefore, uh, you know, with, with, the, uh, with the AMD went into slightly dispopularity because if it is being active, then the things are never the same. So one is proactive, one is reactive. Saurabh, anything you want to add? Uh, I, as you rightly said, sir, in, in treat and extend, we, when, when we, the patient has achieved the maximum disease regression and maximum visual activity gain, then we increase the follow-up by two weeks. And when the patient comes at not not in PRN, patient is coming on every month. We are treating or not treating depending on the scenario, but the patient has to come every month. The follow-ups are a monthly. But here in treat and extend, after suppose three injections, patient has received an optimum outcome. Then we call the patient after six weeks and then inject. Again, we call the patient after eight weeks and then inject up to certain level of um, gap which is decided in different studies have decided this maximum gap of non-treatment as differently. So here the gap is increasing and that is uh, aimed to improve the patients and patients, caregivers, family members, comfort, and they do not need to come monthly for the injection, rather six weekly, two monthly. So gap increases. So it improves the uh, feasibility of treatment. So aim of treatment extends to keep injecting. Yeah. You can't ask the patient not to inject. Although the interval maximum, I think, is allowed is Q12 in most of the studies, but we keep injecting. In PRN, some patients may be lucky, 20-30%, that they may not require treatment at all. Yes, Sir Sachi. Yes, so I just wanted to you know, say that uh, for the postgraduates, you know, the premise is that once treatment is initiated, the treatment is really going to be lifelong. You know, it's almost right. like that. You know, and so you know, some of the experts were asked, uh, you know, how many injections am I going to need? So the expert replied, I'm going to inject your eyes until you die or I die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then the premise oh. is that you really are going to keep needing injections. And you know, if you look at some of the data, which is coming out from the US, UK, the mean number of injections in these studies are like 32 injections, 34 injections. It's like huge number of injections. It's too so, less actually, Sabasachi. People have crossed centuries. Also. Yeah. So then so many patients have actually also crossed centuries. And you need to understand that, you know, the scenario there is different and there is a lot of insurance and other things. But, you know, having said that, you know, it's really going to be lifelong treatment. So how do we actually... Uh, ensure minimum number of injections with maximum uh, visual benefit, right? That is sort of the holy grail we are trying to achieve here. Absolutely. And extend is really helping us in that in terms of, you know, we are trying to push it. We are trying to kick that bucket a little further away every, you know, two weeks at a time so that you can actually reduce the number of injections. However, almost 30 to 40% will start relapsing somewhere in between, you know, they will, uh, we'll have a duration of eight weeks injection free. Then we'll say, okay, now we'll give you an injection after 10 weeks. You know, irrespective of your disease activity. However, you know, a lot of them actually, this 30, 40 percent, and this is generally the time when they start having disease activity and don't last for that 10 weeks. You know, so what we do Absolutely. here, yeah, what we so do what here we do, is, what, yeah, what we do here. So, generally, uh, you know, there are two options. One is you go back to a, a loading dose, that is monthly for three months if you're looking at the same drug, or you go to a slightly better drug with better efficacy, like, uh, you know, prolosuzumab, which has, you know, so you shift or you change course. Or you stay with the same drug, but then again, you have to become more, uh, you know, uh, you have to become so, more. So if you, if, you, if you, what I, uh, majority of my patients over 80 to 90% of Mr. MD today are on treatment extent kind of regimen. Right. Because we maintain a fine balance, as Sabisachi and Saurabh were saying, that we maintain a fine balance between the number of visits 
and the number of injections. On one hand, we want to reduce the number of injections, reduce the number of visits, not at the cost of losing the efficacy, not at the cost of losing the vision, not at the cost of OCT increase or hemorrhage. But I always write, like suppose patients on Q8 kind of regimen, so I'll write, come after say two, two months, oblique SOS. If you have a, if you have an issue, don't delay them. Because then we may have to, uh, you know, uh, work in the opposite direction. Shifali, is that clear? Because I think the question was small, yeah. but the answer was pretty long. No, but I think it made it very clear, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, another question is, could you explain the sort of appearance on view to study uh, once again and highlight its relevance? Say it again. What's the YouTube study? YouTube sort of study. I think sir uh, showed a sort to of appearance. Uh -huh. yeah, uh, so yeah. Highlight its sort relevance. Sort of appearance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, Saram, you want to say? Yeah, uh, can I sh share the slide again? Just yes, yeah, yeah, please. Let me go ahead, sir. So, view view one and view two studied uh, studies uh, uh, did the. Uh, there are four arms in these studies, and uh, one of these arms had two milligrams of aflibercept being given at two monthly gap two monthly intervals after first three injections. So that's where the uh, sawtooth appearance was seen. So, so when we gave the, just a minute. So in this arm three, the gap between two aflipercept injections was two months. So when, what happens when we give injections like uh, the macula becomes, the CNVM lesion starts to heal and then we have reduction in the thickness of the retina and everything, but that maximum effect comes around three to four weeks time or five weeks time. And since the gap is two months, the activity again starts to rise, increase and the macular thickness and uh, activities again starts to increase. So at the end of two months around just before the next two monthly injection, if we know the, mac the mac macular thickness is again risen to a very high level. It was not maintained at low level because the gap between two injections was more. So this, this that's why here the central retinal thickness given in microns is showing a short of thing. But every just every uh, injection uh, between two injections, it is again increasing and going back. Since the gap is more, it is again increasing and then again going back. So view one and view two did not view two did not find any visual significance of this. But in this was again also uh, this was also noted in Hawk and Harrier uh, where it was. Considered that saw toothing ultimately lead, may lead to uh, less than optimum visual equity gain. So saw, saw toothing should be avoided, and that's why two monthly gap was not suitable. So Sachi, you would so like to add? Saw tooth, saw tooth is not a very you know welcome step actually. Saw tooth means that disease activity saw tooth is up down up down. If the thickness is going down, that means disease is uh, responding, and if it starts coming up, that thickness is increasing. That means it is waning now. Effect is waning. So we have to minimize the height of this. Uh, has to be nearly a straight line or a very small uh, division. So upper niche, upper niche bar bar jhula nahi wahan So uh, can I quickly share my slide uh, one screen and just show you? Yes. So this is basically you know from the Hawken Harrier. So if you see this gray line is uh, aflibercept. You know so, so this is aflibercept uh, and the you know, let's look at the second one. So this gray line is the aflibercept and this blue line is brolosuzumab. You know, so, and if you look at the y-axis, it is change, you know, it is, this is change. This is not absolute thickness, it's change in thickness, right, from baseline. So this is 210 microns, that is more reduction and say 30 microns is less reduction, right? So if you see this change, you know, this gray line is going up and down. That means at some point there is 180 micron at sometimes there is only 150 micron change. That means, you know, there's a lot of fluctuation here. So that uh, sort of thing is equal to fluctuation, you know, so we don't want fluctuations and fluctuations are known to be uh, sort of harmful in the long run. So that is, so, you know, the view one view two fluctuation that was seen at uh, every two monthly dosage is exactly the same, which is repeated in the uh, Hawk and Harrier, which uh, Kumar Sarah has already told us. So fluctuation is equal to sort two thing, and that is not good for the long, you know, the long term. So sort two basically is not, uh, you know, a good uh, sign. Like here, uh, like uh, Sabasachi and both of them showed the graph. Therefore, Bulusimab has, he said, has a more drying effect. You have a stable straighter line, comparatively straighter line. If you have too much of fluctuations, that means sometimes the fluid is more, sometimes less. This is not good for the health of the retina. Uh, 
so any questions rolika shivali yeah so, so one more is how can hadid covers uh, the armd aspect very well what is your comment on the side effect of the drug presenting as retinal vasculitis and intraocular inflammation so i was trying to avoid this but uh, still <laughs> everyone yeah, has to avoid this so so if i am allowed to speak on this because hocken herrier uh, the brochure label if you see brochure label says 4% incidence of uh, uh, in ioi and uh, and retinal vascular uh, inflammation including occlusions also but practically speaking uh, we haven't encountered this so out of uh, nearly more than uh, you know 10 to 15000 brochures given in this country there is a huge uh, study done from uh, calcutta only which uh, was popularly known as braille study was done by disha group and lot of other people which did not did not in fact the incidence was 0.4 so i jokingly said uh, i think you know what these people have forgotten to add point so four it is 0.4 actually so this that is what uh, uh, kumar sir have said in uh, second or third last slide that uh, this uh, you know q12 dosing of rosimab did make uh, waves uh, on october 25 uh, 2019 i think it was in san francisco it has launched their uh, rosimab but real world scenario is different because the reason is uh, in in these studies the, uh, the patient is regimented to receive these treatments there is a real world scenario we do not do not give rosimab as is given in as is given in uh, is trials we always uh, you know at least i am giving bulsimab but only on a peer and basis it's a very small molecule and if you give too frequently then sometimes may occur but in the braille study 126 eyes which were published not even a single patient had evidence of io uh, uh, inflammation this uh, vasculitis or or occlusion the transient effect of uh, uh, this inflammation were there in around uh, say few percentage of patients but they all responded without any visual compromise to the eye in with topical uh, steroids so are you like right something yeah so intraocular inflammation is a concern for brucizumab and uh, the the company itself says that if the eye has signs of inflammation in past or has an inflammatory eye disease this drug should not be used sort of that is i think is a stupid kind of statement which is company will keep making Who who on this? Who who will the I inject? I who will inject in an I inflammation? Nobody. I will not inject even Rani Mizumi. I will not inject any. I will give a drug holiday. Ask me to wait. I know this company will keep telling me also, sir, inflammation is the most deadly. Are you stupid? I will never inject. And other point. True. Um, so there was a scenario where there was an inflammatory CNBM which was recurrent and serpiginous choroiditis with inflammation. so that patient i had seen that patient it, he she had received prolucizumab and uh, she her inflammation had flared up needing ivmp and all those things so probably company try pointed to the, such kind of eyes maybe but uh, as for the at for the post graduates what what they should know is that this is a new molecule which is more potent because it is smaller it has better penetration it is more stronger it has more drying effect but there are some uh, unanswered questions like about intraocular inflammation though the the incidence is very low and the uh, evidence is still in the anecdotal stage uh, as far as the indian context is concerned so i think we, we need to collect more data also yeah and sabhasachi and santosh have a huge uh, duty in this respect to you know come out uh, on a big publication and all the centers who are doing policy map should collate the data and i have already requested santosh to work on it so but uh, as far as uh, shivali your question intraocular inflammation is a concern the more we inject the more we collect data the more wiser we become in answering all these questions but as of today uh, as of today it nothing to be feared about so I, i'll just make a quick uh, you know comment just for the post graduates is you know so intraocular inflammation is a whole spectrum and it starts with minimum anterior chamber reaction or just iridocyclitis to uh, you know a lot of uh, retinal inflammation with uh, you know vitritis and then you can have retinal vasculitis which involves the retinal periphery and then you can have you know vasculitis uh, predominantly arteritis which involves the retinal arteries and the worst is occlusive arteritis involving the macula 
you know so that is a uh, event which uh, is not going uh, you know we none of us are looking forward to so you know occlusive retinal vasculitis involving the macula is something that we really need to look at and even if you look at these other large studies you know that is the one which is going to be devastating for vision but that incidence of that is is still much lower than even 0.4 percent however you know having said that you know that vigil still has to be there and sure. uh, Yes, that vigil really must be there in terms of you know whether anything is happening or not. Intraocular inflammation in bolusism map, the peak incidence is around 21 to 22 days. That's about three weeks. You know, so that is leading uh, experts to to think that the mechanism behind this is an antigen antibody kind of reaction or uh, or a type three hypersensitivity kind of reaction because that is what happens in uh, at that kind of time point. You know, but then we don't like Kumar Sarav has already told us we don't exactly know uh, from a pathogenetic point of view or from uh, you know nobody has actually taken a biopsy of that retinal tissue and looked at you know what is really happening you cannot replicate this in rabbit eyes or uh, animal eyes you know because the immune system is entirely different so uh, we don't know why this is really happening but then you know the fact remains that it is definitely happening in the western world and likely when we start using more and more you know let's remember the western world has used about 70,000 injections already and we have used seven to eight thousand so it's still a way to go uh, other thing that uh, you know if uh, you're writing an exam you should probably even write is that it need not happen after after the first injection it can happen after the second injection it can even happen after third the third injection you know so these are some additional points that i thought is that it's a whole spectrum uh, having something which is just causing a little bit of iridocyclate is, is not vision threatening uh, it is still an event but it is not vision threatening uh, having something which is occlusive vasculitis involving the center of the fovea is is very much vision threatening and all of this can happen with map. the incidence goes down as you go from uh, minimum inflammation to very severe inflammation Uh, so one more question is, uh, other than Jeff, do we have any role of laser or PDT for this disease? Say it again, laser or PDT? Not. Other than anti uh, is there any role of laser or PDT like in treatment of these patients? Yeah, I think if the CNVM is, uh, you know, extra foveal, which is laserable, safe zone, then obviously laser becomes a modality. But I think whatever uh, treatment Saurav uh, had described and everybody's Savasachi is also telling is primarily for central CNVM or involving the fovea. So for extra foveal, all of us like to laser because there's the one point treatment, end of treatment. No further required, no inject injections. But for the sub foveal or maybe juxta foveal also, all these injections are required. The issue is that uh, people sometimes get fed up or the doctor gets fed up or because of financial constraints or family issues. PDT is an option, but the op today the issue is that the vertiporphin dye is not available. So otherwise the PDT uh, for such, uh, you know, patients who are fed up of injections, we, I still used to do PDT and especially, specifically for a variant of uh, nuclear AMD, which is known as IPCV, PDT does, does uh, do wonders. So as of today, PDT is not available, honestly. In any of the centers I have inquired, nobody, uh, but PDT is a lovely, you know, uh, uh, treatment choice, as I said, specifically meant for, I used to use it for chronic CSR patients. I used to use it for IPC patients and resistant patients of muscular AMD. Saurav? Yes, sir, I agree with you. Um, laser, uh, I have used uh, very sparingly in one or two patients of CNVM where it was completely extra -poveal. One of them was probably scar-related CNVM, which had recurred, and the age was far away from fovea. Otherwise, I, I would also ask to take your opinions. I have treated one patient with uh, CNVM due to angioid streaks, and that CNVM was quite away from the, just near the arcade. But it happened there within macula. And it was quite far, so I had treated. Uh, see, he had already received injections for uh, subfovial CNVM because of angioid streak. This was a new CNVM because of angioid streak, and the, I had let, done laser to that. That was one scenario why I had used laser. Apart from I would, do, I would do the I would do the same. You see, any laserable CNVM, you should laser it. Simple answer. My definition is sacrosanct area of around 750 microns. We should not because laser is a runoff phenomenon also. So that center area should be spared. The rest, I think, wherever CNVM is there, you can laser. So there is just one question that I would like to ask. 
So since we have all three of you here, if for AMD there is one hypothetical trial that you would like to come up with, what would it be and which drug will you prefer to use? Sort of, sort of hypothetical trial. Yes, sir. Like that would be the one thing that is crossing your mind that it must be done as a trial and is yet to be processed. So like in protocol T in diabetic, diabetic megalodema, there is a head-on trial of all the agents. So uh, I would, uh, I would uh, like, love to have all the four agents standing in the queue and all of all four. A white paper ho, charo ke answer aja. Because today the, the concept is very clear that uh, in DME, the drug of choice is uh, turning out to be eflipercept. And even in, uh, even in AMD, like Saurav was saying, why, why did Hockenhager choose uh, eflipercept and not running this lab was because it had uh, become the standard of care in US. So if uh, Rolika, one question is there, because we want our audience, we want our patients, we want all our doctors to have clarity. And fun clarity now that four drugs are there or five drugs are there. No, don't be biased by anybody. Take uh, all these drugs and do head to head trial on uh, these patients and come out with an answer after, say, in six months, one year, two years. That will put, a, put to rest everything about all these things. Maybe CAT trial with including yeah. brolicism. Okay, absolutely. CAT with brolicism. Absolutely. That, that would, be, would be the dream trial. Rolika, if you allow me, I'll just uh, show uh, you know yes. an example of laser done to uh, you know polypoidal vascular. You know, so this is a eight you know figure of eight shaped huge uh, pigment epithelial detachment, and this is some hemorrhage here. There is some kind of exudation here. You know, so if you see, this is an angiography where you can see this is a you know the PED and this is a block fluorescence because of the uh, hemorrhage and you know you can't make out too much more. This is the ICGA and uh, you know so this is the uh, PED and if you see here you know this is a string of pearls kind of appearance and these are called polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy. You know so this was the laser done. You know so this is the center of the fovea actually. So this is quite away from the center of the fovea. It is uh, you know this is actual fresh laser marks which you are seeing. And you know, so these are all confluent and uh, you know they are looking quite uh, you know bright, but uh, there is a lot of fluid there. So a lot of this disappears. So this is how it looks like after three months. You know this is how it looks like. It's not very badly scarred and it's quite away from the center of the fovea. You know so this quite this quite uh, serves the purpose in you know so if in, instead of uh, a polypoidal vasculopathy, if this was a CNVM, again, you know, we would still probably think about doing this, though it is not very common. Extra, extra foveal polyps are much more common. Extra foveal CNVMs are not that common, are not that common. And, you know, this is an example, another example of a, uh, you know, I don't have the angiography photographs, but this is again hemorrhage here. Uh, so, you know, patient actually underwent, uh, you know, some uh, pneumatic displacement. And after a while, we st we saw the polyps which were away from the fovea. And you know, this is the scar. If you see, this is the scar from uh, the laser. So, this is how laser works quite well in polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy. Coming to the trial, uh, I'll just stop my sh uh, screen share. You know, so coming to the trial, you know, what I would really like to do is compare brolicizumab PR in from baseline versus brolicizumab loading doses and then you know, three monthly, because I think map really works well. Like, uh, you know, I think even Lalit Varmasar was telling us that he uses it most of the times PRN. So we are not yet using map for treatment naive patients. You know, we are starting with either ranibizumab or aflibercept with the fear of inducing intraocular inflammation, right? But then uh, if if I were to use map as a, as as a single drug, you know, I, I think I can manage even without giving a loading dose for brolicizumab. And, uh, you know, I would really like to see a trial which compares brolicizumab PRN right from baseline versus brolicizumab that has been used for Hawk and Harrier. And this should be done for treatment naive as well as pre-treated treated patients separately. Yeah, wonderful. Your slides are very good. The only issue here, Sabasachi, in your first set of slides was that we are treating only the polyps. Correct. Whereas PDT tends to treat apart from polyps the BVN also. Right. Because BVN, the branching vascular network is one of the major cause for recurrence. But uh, the result uh, here was phenomenal. It's what I said, whatever is laserable, it should be laser. Because that puts an end to the treatment, makes it even more finite. Number of injections are not there at all. I think so wonderful that. job. Any other question, Rolika? 
So I think we have covered all Shivali the Deepti. So I think uh, with this, uh, we should wind up yes, uh, this sir. session with thanks to Kumar Saurav, who did, uh, wonder, Santosh has arrived just now. <laughs> it was a wonderful talk uh, done by, uh, you know, virtually a very difficult talk, you know, such, you give such difficult topics. How can he cover all the trials? So therefore, but he, the way he built up story, I like them. So although the number of trials he narrowed down to four or uh, five, nine or so, but, but ultimately develop the concept rather than, you know, telling us mnemonics about what is Marina, what is Anchor and how to remember that. Well, that was never my desire also. The desire is what was the need? Initial need, uh, like he started with macular photo study, the graph going down. Graph going down and then after this wonder drugs or miracle drugs came up, the graph started going up. So one point was achieved. Second point was how to increase the interval. And fourth point, which I think uh, Santosh, you can cover sometimes, is how to economize ultimately. See, because yes, economy is today playing a very major role in, uh, you know, uh, you know, in, in compliance the patient because there are a lot of patients. If the company, if the company or the TPA is paying, nobody cares. But if you have to pay from the pocket, believe me, it's a huge expense. And Sabasachi added fuel to the fire by saying that it's a lifelong treatment. Lifelong, how many patients can keep affording? So that is the burning issue. Apart from now, we have novel drugs. I think biosimilars also we didn't touch. But biosimilars sort of are playing a, a huge role today because uh, with the availability of uh, Vizumab, Rani Vizu, uh, this uh, uh, Razumab and so many other drugs by so many companies. And I'm sure in coming year, maybe this year itself, the price of uh, Rani Vizu is going to come down to nearly 1,000 rupees because of so much of competition. I think we, with this, we thank uh, Saurav for building up an excellent, believe me, doing justice to a thank very you. difficult topic. Did a great job. So I must compliment uh, Saurav for this. Thank and Sabasachi for pitching in his own thank slides you. also. Sabasachi, yeah. you know, in fact, he has a ready-made uh, bank of this thing. And he, he explained a couple of points very, very uh, nicely on his photographs. And thank uh, Rolika, Shivali, and most important, Santosh, for saving this and having us here. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Till we meet.